high Renaissance art. What you'll see as we talk today about high Renaissance art is that there is a lot of continuity from what was happening in the early Renaissance into what is happening in the high Renaissance. First of all, there's a lot of continuity of ideas. Humanism is going to continue to be important. Neoplatonism will continue to be important. Secondly, there's also a lot of continuity in terms of artistic style. The new Renaissance classicism that was just emerging during the early Italian Renaissance is by the high Italian Renaissance going to be kind of fully developed and fully exploited. So a lot of the ideas that we've already introduced in class and a lot of the things that we've already talked about will continue to be really important for us today as we look at these examples of high Renaissance art. Okay, you should have already watched the short video that we linked on Canvas about Savonarola and how his rise to power in Florence leads to a kind of inhospitable climate for artists and helps contribute to artists moving towards Rome uh, where the Catholic Church is there waiting to pay for all sorts of works of art and architecture to enhance its reputation. Um, and we just have to kind of remember that when we had the Great Schism and the Papal Court moved into France for a time. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. When that happened, Rome kind of became like a backwater town. There wasn't a lot of money being spent on keeping up infrastructure. It kind of got run down. There weren't a lot of people living there because the Pope wasn't there any longer. And so towards the end of the early Renaissance, so the last quarter of the 15th century and into the high Renaissance period, and the High Renaissance technically uh, is usually dated from about 1500 to about 1525. Um, the Catholic Church during that, those periods is incredibly invested in good PR. They want Rome to reflect uh, how wonderful and magnificent the Catholic Church is. And they feel like the way to do that is to commission a lot of works of art to go in the churches, to build new churches. And in fact, this building campaign that the Catholic Church is, is beginning during this time period, it's honestly going to continue into the Baroque period, uh, about 100 years from this point in time, even, even beyond that in Italy. So this is going to be a long, drawn-out period of construction and decoration, and all of it is meant to give the Catholic Church, uh, or reflect, rather, a, a kind of magnificence upon the Catholic Church. So remember that the leaders of the Catholic Church, the popes, they are also the leaders of the papal states at this point in time. Uh, and you can see that there's a number of other city states in Italy, just as we had during the early Renaissance. We continue to have that kind of um, differentiation of territory, even though they are all united in terms of cultural heritage and language and things, we do have different, uh, different governments. Now, some art will still be commissioned in Florence, but the majority of high Renaissance art is commissioned in those papal states, especially in Rome. Okay, so here are two very well-known leaders from this time period uh, from the Catholic Church. Uh, we have on the left, Julius II, uh, and Julius II was uh, a very powerful pope during the high Renaissance. And uh, not only was he politically very powerful and dominant, but he was also uh, a great patron for the arts and for art architecture. A lot of the works that we'll talk about in the High Renaissance were commissioned by Pope Julius II. Um, one of the major ideas that we'll talk about in terms of High Renaissance style is how comfortable the Catholic Church has become with classical ideas. And where we talked about the early Renaissance as being a combination of the classical and the Christian, that's gonna to continue to a heightened degree in the high Renaissance. So uh, amongst the top ranking Catholic officials, there are very few of them in the high Renaissance that have any qualms whatsoever about these pagan classical philosophies. Uh, and in fact, Leo X, who is uh, from the Medici family, and that's his image on the right that you see. Leo X loved antiquity. Um, he even modified some Vatican ceremonies during his tenure 
to include references to pagan gods, like especially marriages and funerals. So right there in the heart of the Catholic Church during important Catholic rites and ceremonies, classical antiquity was brought into play. So the classical and the Christian really being uh, fully unified during this high Renaissance period. We have to remember too that the Catholic Church, they are really interested in propagandizing their reputation. They want Rome to reflect the grandeur of the Catholic uh, state and the Catholic Church itself. So they're heavily invested in buying art and architecture during this period. Okay, so what do we actually see in High Renaissance art? We've already talked about how there's a lot in common between early and High Renaissance art. We already talked about how artists left Florence and came to Rome to work for the Catholic Church and that the Catholic Church was very comfortable with these kind of pagan philosophies and classical ideas that had uh, come into culture with the Renaissance. So if you look at this slide, this looks a lot like the slide that we have for our discussion of the early Italian Renaissance, but there's just a few words that are different. So in the early Italian Renaissance slide, for instance, it says influence of humanism, and here we have perfected humanism. So where in the early Renaissance, we had artists who were interested in humanism, but didn't always have the know-how or the full understanding to show the human body correctly. In the high Renaissance, these are artists that are really, um, in depth with their understanding of the human body. In fact, a lot of the main figures of the High Renaissance, Leonardo and Michelangelo, for instance, were doing dissections themselves and their knowledge about human anatomy was beyond the knowledge of artists, excuse me, of professors rather of anatomy at the universities of the time. So it was really hard culturally to do dissections at this point in history and it was it was frowned upon. It was seen as something that was kind of uh, something to be avoided. And so Leonardo and Michelangelo, when they're doing these, they're often doing them kind of secretively. Um, Michelangelo, for instance, makes a deal with a hospital and says, hey, I will create a really beautiful sculpted crucifix for you. Um, if you will let me dissect some of the some of the bodies of, of the deceased that you have there at the hospital, that's at uh, the ho hospital San Spirito. So he um, is doing this kind of secretively, Leonardo as well as doing it kind of secretively, but they're really learning an incredible amount about the human body by doing this. Um, a lot of other artists who aren't necessarily always doing dissections are also getting better at anatomy because of the academic practices of the time. They're spending a lot of time studying antiquities um, of sculptures, those perfected human sculptures from the days of classical antiquity. They're really heavily emphasized for artists as um, kind of their means of study in this period. So when we see humanism in the high renaissance, it's perfected. The human body is perfected. Anatomy is completely accurate. The proportions are all convincing. The poses are convincing. They use a lot of contrapposto here and they continue to use a lot of nudity. Uh, and remember, you know, nudity can be controversial. This is a Christian society, but amongst those who are aware of Platonic kinds of ideas uh, in these higher circles, especially the patrons of the Catholic Church, they're really comfortable with the nudity and they see it in a Neoplatonic light. Looking at the nude human body is something that's beautiful. Looking at the nude human body is something that's full of mathematical and the golden mean. So in those ways, it's very truthful. So when we look at the nude human form, it's something that can spiritually elevate you. It can bring you closer to truth. It can bring you closer to God. So just kind of keep, you know, that connection between humanism and Neoplatonism in your mind because they're very interconnected. We have perfected human emotions and of course, portraits continue at this point in time as well. We also have perfected Neoplatonism. So remember, Neoplatonism heavily emphasizes the ideal or the beautiful, heavily emphasizes the mathematical because um, beauty is based on math. Then math and beauty kind of become interconnected. And since math is a metaphysical truth, then when we look at things that are mathematical or we look at things that are beautiful for the Neoplatonists, that means we're looking at things that are truthful. And because these are Neoplatonists that are Christians, they say, when we look at those things that are truthful, we are coming closer to God. We have a better understanding of God because he's the one who is the author of all of this truth. So uh, when we're talking about perfected Neoplatonism, 
What's different here? In the early Renaissance, sometimes they were so focused on the mathematical that things became too stiff, uh, too frozen, like too calculated, and that's not very lifelike. And in the high Renaissance, they're able to kind of relax that math just enough. It's still there, it's still perfected, but they relax it just enough that the bodies don't look so frozen, that there's a sense of life, that things look uh, look very believable in that way. So it's perfected in the high Renaissance. We continue to see idealized nude human forms. We've already talked about that connection with humanism above. We want things to be beautiful and believable. Remember, Plato himself taught that art should be mimetic of nature. Right? It, should, it should look believable like nature does. But of course, uh, in the Renaissance, they also want that to be a really beautiful, idealized representation of nature because the more beautiful it is, the more truthful it is, and the more you get uh, godliness in the work in that aspect. And then, of course, using all the, the math, uh, just like they did in the early Renaissance, here, again, mathematical ratios, proportions, perspective, compositions, emphasizing the human body and the way it shows math. So all of those are things that we had in the early Renaissance, but now in the high Renaissance, it's not, um, it's not sometimes a little bit inaccurate or it's not sometimes a little bit unbelievable, but instead it's really perfected. We're going to continue to see also a combination of the classical with the Christian, but where we had a combination of the old and the new in the early Renaissance, that will be eliminated in the high Renaissance. And instead, all of those Gothic elements, those things that we said are old fashioned or anachronistic or a little bit unbelievable, those are all going to be removed from artistic style. And instead, it is incredibly believable and incredibly perfected. So we also have a perfection of early Renaissance elements, chiaroscuro, mathematics, um, mathematic perspective, atmospheric perspective, interest in antiquity, right, where they use those classical styles or classical objects or classical stories. Uh, a sense of calculation is still going to be there and logic is still going to be there. Now let's reverse just a little bit. I kind of skipped over that pyramidal compositions text there. In the early Renaissance, remember we had a preference for triangular compositions. They were mathematical, they were balanced, they were calculated, they very much appealed to the mindset of the early Italian Renaissance artists who was trying to show himself to be kind of an intellectual and was trying to incorporate math. Well, in the high Renaissance, we move to something that's similar, but very, very different. Uh, and it's a pyramidal composition. So it is still balanced. It is still harmonious. It is still mathematical, but it has a greater sense of believable space. So if you think about a triangle, that's kind of flat, right? Well, pyramid has more three dimensionality to it. So these are compositions that really just are so convincing in terms of the space that they incorporate. They're still really balanced. They're still... Um, very mathematical in that way, but they are just much more accurate in terms of creating an illusion of space. Okay, in the high Renaissance, we also have this thing called diseño. We'll talk about that in a minute. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We are going to see more symbolic kind of references in the works, and we're going to see a couple of new things. So we have these terms here, gratia sumato, and then of course a three-quarter view for portraits. So gratia, and I know I don't speak Italian, so forgive me for sounding kind of ridiculous, but um, it's this notion of encompassing grace and showing grace and elegance. Um, this is something we actually had during the early Renaissance, but in the early Renaissance, sometimes the elegance was emphasized to such an extent that it took away from the realism. In the high Renaissance, the, the gracefulness and the elegance will never overcome the realism or eliminate the realism and instead you get something that's really believable but oh my gosh it is so lovely and so graceful um, that's going to be a huge component of the high renaissance style we're also going to have something called sfumato it's kind of a soft hazy um, effect on the edges of the figures and the objects within the work that makes them feel more unified on the whole with the composition sometimes in the early renaissance the edges of things were a little bit linear, a little bit hard edged, um, kind of like you cut out paper dolls and you're sticking them on, you know, a, a back a background or something. 
in the in the high renaissance they're going to kind of get away from that linear edge and they're going to use something that's really soft with the chiaroscuro uh really kind of smoky in in the edges of things and it just makes objects feel inseparable from their setting and again this is something that enhances the believability and the realism of the scenes okay they're going to move to a three-quarter view for portraits in the early renaissance they did profile portraits here in the high renaissance they'll do the three-quarter view now the other thing that's going to change <clears throat> excuse me, is that we will have fresco and tempera like we did in the early Renaissance, but we're going to add in another dominant common medium, and that's oil. So remember, oil was the medium of choice in the north during the Renaissance, but it's not really until the 16th century that we start to see that employed in a widespread level in Italy. Leonardo is going to kind of, you know, be the forerunner of that in some ways, and the artist working in Venice. Uh, but when they do start to use oil, they're going to be able to achieve some different kinds of effects in their works. Okay, so um, another idea that we need to kind of talk about in the High Renaissance is the idea that artists have really kind of changed in their social status in contrast to the days of the early Renaissance. So in the early Renaissance, they were craftsmen. And remember, we talked about how that begins to change during the early Renaissance, we said, due to the cult of deeds and the cult of fame, right, this whole uh, mindset in society that wanted to celebrate people that did amazing things by making them famous, those artists are increasingly awarded with fame and respect as, as the century goes on. And by the time we get into the high Renaissance, these artists are incredibly well respected. And in fact, there are texts that talk about them as being godlike. Right. Artists create, God creates, these artists are godlike. So they've really risen in station. We have to understand that a lot of these artists were very much deserving of these kinds of reputations because they were what we call a Renaissance man, right? They're polymaths. They can do so many different kinds of things in different uh, knowledge areas and different kinds of skills, and they can do them all incredibly well. Okay, and this is a connection in with another idea that's dominant in High Renaissance. It's an idea that comes up in Castiglione's Book of the Courtier. It's this notion of sprezzatura. And essentially the idea is this, that you do something that's difficult, but you make it look as though it's second nature. You make it look as though it's easy. You're nonchalant about it. Um, you are talented in many different areas, but you just make it seem like it couldn't have possibly have been any other way. Like this is the way it's naturally supposed to have been, that it comes to you with ease. That's kind of the idea of Sprezzatura. And these artists are reflecting that same sort of cultural mindset. They do incredibly difficult kinds of works of art. They are incredibly technically masterful with these works of art, but they make it look as though it's easy, like it couldn't have been any other way. So you can see how these two ideas are related. They do so many different things. They're successful and accomplished at all of these different things. You can see how this is also tied in with the humanism of the age, right? Celebrating people for their uh, minds, for their bodies, for their accomplishments, uh, and how that reflects in even with the cult of deeds. Now, one of the other ideas that's helping artists gain better reputations are these ideas about diseño. So artists wanted to be seen increasingly throughout the early Renaissance and into the high Renaissance as intellectuals. We are more than someone that just works with their hands. We are really rigorously working with our minds as well. And diseño was one of the ways that they felt like they could kind of um, make art an intellectual process. So diseño is this idea that you are drawing and sketching for design purposes, right? So here we're looking at um, some drawings from Leonardo and he's trying to work out, you know, how this pose might work, how the anatomy works, if this is the pose, um, really just kind of thinking about that before he commits it into his final design. So the idea of diseño is essentially using your intellect through creating sketches so that your end design is very harmonious. Uh, and so these Italian high Renaissance artists are practitioners of diseño. They're doing a lot of drawings. They're really thinking it out. How can my painting work together? How can the composition work? How can I communicate this idea and this story? So, um, you know, making these drawings for the purposes of design and letting your mind and your intellect really work during this process, that is diseño.
Okay, so this is just Beyonce and Jay-Z. They did this video. I honestly, I have to say to you, I have not seen the whole video all the way through. Um, but I just want to kind of point out these artists in the high Italian Renaissance are incredibly well known even today. It's really easy to connect to this kind of work because we can value it on its appearance, right? We can look at it and say that is believable, that's not believable, that is beautiful. Um, it makes it really easy for us to give like value judgments. And I think that that's one of the reasons that they have persisted in their popularity. We have to understand too that they really are very talented artists and that's another reason that uh, contributes to their long-standing popularity. These guys are standing in front of the Mona Lisa. She is insured for 780 million or billion dollars. I am getting it confused in my mind right now but 780 either million or billion dollars. It's got to be million. It can't be billion but it's like a ridiculous amount of money and it is thronged by tourists. Like when you go to the Louvre and it's, by, it's kind of a smaller painting, it's behind a plastic, uh, or I guess it's probably bulletproof glass of some sort, partition. It is just this huge group of people and they all want to go and see the Mona Lisa because she's so famous. I think it's kind of a disappointing painting. I mean, I don't like hate it, but I don't love it. I don't find it really transfixing or really even that wonderful or even that beautiful. But that doesn't matter what the point I want you to just kind of make, uh, understand here is that this is an artistic period that's very well known and very well respected throughout history and even until today. Okay, so the first example that we're going to look at, this is Leonardo da Vinci. This is his Madonna of the Rocks. Now, Leonardo is a little bit older than Michelangelo and Raphael. He's working in a high Renaissance style really before the other artists are picking up on that. Um, he is really just taking those ideas from the early Renaissance and he is taking out all those old fashioned elements and just fully embracing the new Renaissance classicism and the classical ideas of humanism and Neoplatonism. So he's working in oil. Um, this one here, we're looking at Mary and the Christ Child. Uh, and we're looking at the angel Uriel. Uh, and John the Baptist. Okay, now what might confuse you is that Mary has her arm around John the Baptist and then the Christ child is sitting next to the angel Uriel. And this is a story from the Catholic tradition. They're out in the wilderness fleeing danger and they kind of meet up together. Okay, there's a couple of different versions of this work. If you've read the Da Vinci Code, I think is the one where Dan Brown talks about this work. There's all sorts of conspiracy theories about why there's two. Most scholars agree that likely what happened is Leonardo starts working on the commission, doesn't ever finish it, kind of drags his feet, which he's known to do. Um, he, he is really not considering himself primarily to be an artist, right? He's got a lot of irons in the fire and art is kind of down on his list. He writes this letter to the Duke of Milan trying to get a job and just as a postscript, he says, Hey, and I'll paint whatever you want painted. So just kind of reflecting that whole notion that he sees himself as more than just an artist. But he likely didn't finish this because of that. Uh, likely ended up selling it kind of, or you know, roughly finishing it and then just selling it off because the original commission had been drawn out for so long. And then uh, it seems to be that those who had paid for the original or had ordered the original painting did still want a version. And so uh, he does a second version. That is the most likely explanation. Nothing really like incredibly exciting or, or uh, you know, intriguing. Uh, but Leonardo, as we said, is a Renaissance man. He does so many different things. I mean, he's a, he's a designer, an engineer, an inventor, a scientist, a sculptor, painter, architect, military strategist, writer, musician, anatomist, physicist, meteorologist, like it just goes on and on. We have only 10 works that are fully attributed to him that are finished. We do have more that are unfinished. We have more that are recorded that don't survive, but really it's a very small number. One thing that we need to just kind of realize before we start to look at this in detail is that Leonardo is incredibly influential in his own time. He is actually really fascinated by Alberti and the writings that he does. Remember we talked about Alberti with the early Renaissance. We said Alberti is translating ancient books on art by Vitruvius. He is um, talking about what classical art and architecture were like. He's talking about in these texts, Alberti is, he's talking about humanism and Neoplatonism. He's also expanding on those classical ideas and talking about what he thinks art should be. And remember he said art should be a window on the world and that history paintings were the best kind. And he kind of sets this expectation that's gonna last for over 400 years. Well, Leonardo is reading those uh, ideas 
from Alberti, and he's agreeing with Alberti. Then Leonardo writes his own treatises on art. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, um, you know, these ideas of Alberti find voice in Leonardo and find even further influence through Leonardo. So setting up this expectation that art should be believable, that it should be beautiful, that history painting is the best kind of subject matter because it gives you the most opportunity to exercise your intellectuality as an artist. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about how this reflects high Renaissance style. We have humanism being shown here. Uh, we have believable human emotions, even though the sense of emotion is restrained. We have individualized human faces. We have believable bodies with accurate proportions. Uh, and Leonardo here is looking at infant bodies versus grown-up bodies, and he realizes that the proportions are different. He very often is using mathematical ratios in his proportions for the human body. Uh, the poses are very accurate, right? You've got the, the baby kind of sitting crisscross, uh, the Christ child rather, and then you've got the kneeling kind of posture of John the Baptist. These poses are believable, right? So not only just trying to make the body in anatomy and proportion look accurate, but in the way that it is posed. Uh, so we also have, in addition to humanism, we have Neoplatonism, right? Um, the nude human form is something that's beautiful, even though these are just infants. Uh, we have a great emphasis on beauty and the ideal in the two, um, the angel and in Mary as well, the two other figures. Uh, we have a beautiful kind of setting. So all of this emphasis on the beautiful and the ideal, remember, the beauty is created by math. And so you have math, you have beauty. What you really have is truth. And Neoplatonism says, well, when you have truth, you know that you have God because God is the one who gave us truth. So there's Neoplatonism here. There's also a lot of math, uh, mathematical perspective being used here, a mathematical composition. We have a pyramidal composition we talked about. It's balanced. It's harmonious. It has a great sense of progression into space and recession into space. So that is mathematic as well. So that's Neoplatonic. Okay, but things are perfected here. We don't have things that are old fashioned. We don't have things that we look at and say like, oh, well, Leonardo didn't quite get the anatomy right there or the space really isn't very convincing. Instead, we look at it and we feel like it's an incredibly believable scene. This is a technically masterful kind of style. His chiaroscuro and his modeling is all completely convincing. His use of space, his detailing, everything is just really accurate. Hey, okay, now, he is using this technique that we talked about, the sfumato. He's the pioneer of this technique. Uh, it means smoky in Italian, and you can see how you really couldn't separate these figures from their settings. And that sense of, you know, of continuity between the figures and the objects and the settings that they all are actually in the same space really enhances the realism. So it's a very soft edge. We'll see a detail in a minute that creates that sense of unification. Okay, he's also doing grazia. Right? These figures are lovely. They're elegant. They're graceful. Uh, if you look at Mary, for instance, and the tilt of her head to the side, that's very graceful and lovely. Uh, the angel Uriel is also very graceful and lovely, but it's not so graceful that it's unbelievable, right? So grazia. We know that Leonardo was a wonderful practitioner of disegno. We'll look at some sketches in a moment. Remember, that's that intellectual practice that he's making, you know, this harmonious design through these intellectual um, approaches to sketches. And then there's some symbolism here. So usually there's more symbolism in these high Renaissance works than in the early Renaissance works. Uh, first of all, we've got rocky cliffs. We've got caves in the background. There's references there to the biblical Song of Songs by Solomon, uh, which refers to Mary's virginity. Okay. Then we also have, of course, just notions of the nativity uh, and the sepulcher, right? The kind of caves that those um, are rocky areas that those take place in. So those kinds of references too. We have water in the foreground. That references baptism and purity. It seems as though this is occurring in a closed space, so they seem separate from the world. And again, that's a notion to talk about the purity of these kind of figures. Here's a detail where you can see that sfumato technique coming through. You can see the drapery is incredibly believable and three-dimensional. All of that modeling to create that sense of 3D is, is very well done. Uh, but if you look at the edges of Mary, we don't really see a, a line, like an outline. Instead, we just see this soft, gradual um, recession into space. We see a very kind of hazy finish on the edges. That is sfumato. <clears throat> 
here's a detail where you can maybe see that uh, in a little more um, with a little more information. There's the Kahoot that we would do if we were in class. Okay, and that takes us to the next example on our list, which is Leonardo's Last Supper. Uh, he does this for the Duke in Milan, uh, for the, and he, the Duke is doing it for the refectory. Okay, so he's good at, got this high class uh, patron paying for it to be done in a monastery. The refectory is like the cafeteria for the monks. Uh, I know that this is not a great image because you got that binding of the book down the center, but this does really show the state of the fresco before underwent extensive renovations. Uh, it was like a 20 or 30 year renovation project. It was finished pretty recently uh, and they removed all of the overpaint that was added over the centuries because we know that Leonardo was experimental uh, and we know that he did a layered technique here with this fresco, which did not pan out well because it encouraged humidity uh, to accumulate behind the layers. And so just big chunks of plaster would just fall off. Uh, the first restoration for this was done during Leonardo's own lifetime. So we're seeing it here in a pretty sad state of affairs. It's incredibly famous nonetheless. Uh, here is the Gerbo ad based on The Last Supper. It's like a brand of jeans. I don't think anybody's heard of it these days. Star Wars version of The Last Supper. Simpsons version of The Last Supper. NBA version of The Last Supper. Nintendo. Lego. And here we are back to the actual fresco after the restoration has taken place. Um, let me just show you some of the copies that were done during Leonardo's uh, own lifetime. They were done very recently after this work because it was very famous even in its own time. Here is one from Cesare Magna and you can see all of the textures, all of the beautiful colors and all of the details that are here in this copy. We know that those have been lost in Leonardo's version. Here is another copy from the Tongerlo Abbey, um, probably by an artist named Gian Pietrino. He's also a contemporary of Leonardo. Um, his is oil on canvas. Okay, so kind of, again, we see more details, we see um, more emphasis on, on colors and things that we just are missing in the state of the fresco today. So here we're back to Leonardo's version. So the, the areas that have the dark color, those are the original parts of the fresco that still survive. The areas that have the light color, those are filled in with some really kind of innocuous types of watercolors just to give you an idea of what Leonardo originally had there, but to say it has been lost. So if you look at that contrast between dark and light colors, you see how little of this actual fresco still survives. Nonetheless, it's still a wonderful example of high Renaissance style. Um, Leonardo, as we know, is just really a, a great example of that high Renaissance approach. So we have perfected elements Right. Space is perfected here. Mathematical perspective is perfected. Atmospheric perspective is perfected. Chiaroscuro and modeling poses. Everything really is just incredibly believable uh, and very much uh, perfected in terms of its realism. We know that in the High Renaissance, they used all of that math for Neoplatonic purposes, but they didn't let it limit the realism. Not only do we have math used for Neoplatonism, but we also have that sense of the beautiful and the ideal, uh, and that too is Neoplatonic. So those are truths that they are including in the painting. And when we have those truths included in the painting, Neoplatonists would say that brings us closer to understanding God. Humanism here is perfected as well. Leonardo, of course, had a very extensive knowledge of the human body. He is able to accurately render it in terms of proportions using the golden mean in terms of anatomy, in terms of pose, right? These are kind of complicated interconnected poses with this group of people around the table, but Leonardo makes it look very lifelike and really captures a sense of what it would be like to be kind of 
you know, squished up around this table on one side of it with all of these different figures. So perfected human pose as well. Um, he is also very humanistic in the way that he focuses on human emotion and facial expressions. Leonardo was really one that felt like you could communicate uh, a lot about the psychology of a figure and the personality of a figure through their emotional expressions and through their gestures. So he spent a lot of time studying those and trying to create really the best, most accurate kinds of expressions and gestures to convey what it was that he wanted to convey in his works. Okay, so uh, we know Leonardo was again a good example of the Renaissance man. Not only is he an accomplished artist, but he's uh, doing many things and doing them very well. He's also using uh, Grazia here and Desenio. So this is a very graceful representation. When we see the detail of Christ, uh, that figure, you'll see he really is uh, a very elegant representation of Christ. Now there's greater symbolism going here. With this one in particular, there's a lot of mathematical symbolism, which is great, right? Because the more math you put in, the more truth you put in, according to Neoplatonists. And the more truth you put in, then the closer you get to God through your artwork. So um, we've got four groups of three here, right? And there's so many different you know, meanings in Catholic belief associated with these different numbers. Three, for instance, some of the most common, of course, it's the number of the Trinity, the days until Christ's resurrection, uh, three theological virtues. The number four is uh, the number of the cardinal virtues. It's the number of the seasons. It's the number of the corners of the earth. It's the number of man, right? Because we've got four appendages. It's the number of the elements of the earth. So we've got kind of these, the godly coming together with the earthly. And then we have to remember four plus three equals seven. And seven was a number of perfection. There were uh, Mary's seven sorrows, the seven deadly sins. Uh, and then, of course, four times three is 12. And that's the number of the apostles, the number of the months of the year. Um, lots of different references with the number 12 as well. So all of these kind of symbols based on math were not only Neoplatonic, but were meant to kind of enhance the message of the work and to show Leonardo is a Renaissance man, right? He is an intellectual. Here's a detail you can see. This is Judas in the foreground of this uh, trio of figures. He's clutching his money bag. He's reaching uh, forward to like the same area where Christ is reaching. Uh, you have Peter behind him leaning forward, and then you have John, the beloved, uh, next to Peter. Peter's the older figure. John is the younger. John's traditionally shown kind of effeminate, young, without a beard. So the whole notion that this is Mary Magdalene in the work really doesn't carry a lot of um, persuasion with it. It's fascinating, it's interesting, but it's not very convincing. And here's that close up of Christ and you can see that he is a very graceful figure. Um, here, just in his figure alone, you can see a really great example of a pyramidal composition. It's balanced, it's symmetrical, but he reaches out towards us in our space. Uh, and I really think that the whole thing is very pyramidal in its in its composition. And then within that, here with Christ, again, a pyramidal kind of effect. If you see some of these details in the foreground, um, you know, there's little passages here and there that just indicate to us how believable it was in terms of textures and details. And Leonardo really is different from his contemporaries. He emphasizes textures and details much more than someone like Michelangelo or Raphael. Here over here, you can see uh, the glass uh, reflection of the carafe, of the, of the glasses, the metallic sheen of the bowls, and uh, really how reflective that is. It kind of gives us an idea of just how much texture and detail he did include. Hey, this is one of his sketches for this. Remember, he's a practitioner of Desenio. Let's work out the possibilities in composition and narrative through these sketches. Let's give our mind a chance to work as we sketch and get ready for our final composition. Let's be an intellectual uh, in our pursuit. He originally had Judas planned to be on the other side of the table, which was kind of traditional, uh, but instead he decides to bring him around on the other side. I think I love this sketch as well because it shows how he was thinking about showing the different emotional states of the figures. Right, we've got one figure here just has thrown himself down on the table in despair um, and the different kind of ranges of emotional reactions that we get for these different figures. Okay, so here, this isn't on your slide list. I just want you to kind of like check in with yourself and see how you're doing. Um, 
on the left, we have one work, and on the right, we have another. These are both renditions of St. Sebastian. He was an early Christian martyr who was, as you can see, shot with arrows by the Romans. And I want you to just try and identify which one of these belongs to the early Renaissance and which one of these belongs to the high Renaissance. So think about what we've been talking about uh, over these last examples with the high Renaissance. Sumato, complicated poses that are still really believable, math without seeming stiff and frozen, um, you know, atmospheric perspective, mathematical perspective, uh, human emotions being perfected, you know, Platonism being perfected, right? These are all things that we would talk about as associating with the high Renaissance. So which one do you think? We'll talk about it in class next time we come back and see if you were right. Okay, so here we're looking at Michelangelo, right? Another one of those high Renaissance greats. Uh, he, as we said, was a very accomplished anatomist, but he's another Renaissance man. I mean, he does a lot of different things and he does them well. He's a very long career uh, and, uh, you know, he does poetry, he does literature, he does architecture, he does painting, he does sculpture. Uh, sculpture was really his his thing. That's really uh, what appealed to him. He does a number of different kinds of things. He does them all. He makes them look easy, right? So it's that notion of sprezzatura, just like Leonardo. We're going to do these things. We're going to be very well and very accomplished at all of these things. We're going to make it seem nonchalant. We're going to make it seem second nature. Okay, so sprezzatura being used here. Now, this one here is in St. Peter's today, the new St. Peter's. Um, it was originally in a smaller church next to St. Peter's that was destroyed when St. Peter's was renovated and extended during the Renaissance and Baroque periods. Um, in 1970, some guy with a hammer went crazy on it and it was damaged. So now it's behind, um, it's behind like this big glass partition. You can't get near it. But this is the work that really sets off Michelangelo's career. It's in a harder marble uh, and he was able to really kind of show his talent here. Um, the legend is that someone came and saw the work and didn't think that it really could be Michelangelo because it was too amazing. And so that then he went back and, and put his name on the sash that goes across Mary's chest after that point in time. Uh, but even though it was well received, there was some criticism. Some people said like, oh, Mary is too youthful, right? To be this grown woman with an adult son who's passed away. And Michelangelo's counter to that was, well, it's, Sin that makes people old and ugly and Mary of course wasn't prone to that so she still remains youthful and beautiful uh, but that's symbolic right so there's some of that symbolism uh, Mary is sitting on a rock you know the whole symbolism of the rock of the church that Peter is the rock of the church that the Catholic Church is the continuation of Christ's ministry on the earth so all those kinds of notions that support uh, the Catholic Church are, are very much a part of this work here. And we just need to remember that the Catholic Church was an influential patron of the High Renaissance, um, that it was uh, not only an influential patron, but it was really invested in using art and architecture to further its reputation. They want to use art and architecture as good PR, essentially. Now, if we kind of think too about the time frame that we're talking about, not only is the Catholic Church really thinking about that because they want Rome to suitably reflect the, the magnificence of the Catholic Church, and they're trying to remodel the city to kind of catch up with the times. But we have to start looking at dates and start realizing that we're getting close to the Protestant Reformation. You know, the official date for that beginning is 1517 with Martin Luther, but there are a lot of things happening in the decades before that. There's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of calls for reform. There's a lot of complaints within the Catholic Church. So not only are they trying to kind of overcome the great schism in their past, but they're also trying to combat these, um, these issues that they're facing as we move into the years right before the Protestant Reformation. So art and architecture is propaganda. It's really important to the Catholic Church at this point in time. Okay, if we look here though, a beautiful example of high Renaissance style. Okay, this is a really kind of awkward composition because it's a full-grown woman holding a full-grown man, right? It's called a pieta. It is a northern tradition to show the adult Mary holding the adult dead Christ on her lap and kind of in sorrow. And in fact, it was a French cardinal who's the one that pays for this work to be done. So the northern kind of tradition coming into play there. How hard is that to show? Uh, and yet Michelangelo 
is able to do this in a way that we don't immediately notice that, right? We don't look at this and say like, oh, that is so unconvincing. Like Mary is enormous. If we look at it closely and think about it, then yeah, we do. We do see that, but we don't immediately notice it. So he's very humanistic in that way. And he's really trying to take this difficult composition and making it, make it as convincing as he can in terms of what he's working with. Okay, so Mary is pretty large here, but she is ideal. Her body is in correct proportions. Christ is also ideal with correct proportions. And you can see Michelangelo's in-depth understanding of anatomy coming through, right? You can see the tendons and the muscles of this figure. Uh, and he is really an idealized figure for being deceased. You know, he's, he's looking as fit as possible as a deceased person can look. Um, so that is very humanistic as well. But Michelangelo is using the golden mean he's using mathematical proportions to make those bodies look accurate in their in their um, proportions and so on so that's very humanistic and it's also very neoplatonic right let's create ideal forms let's use a lot of math in our in our creation of the ideal human form so that we can incorporate truth and we can draw closer to god and not only are these figures ideal but they really are very graceful and um, you know the tilt of mary's head the loveliness of her face, and we'll look at a detail in a minute of Christ, All, both of them really elegant, really graceful figures, but it's not something that takes away from the lifelike uh, rendition of them. So that grace combined with believability, that's the whole notion of grazia that we see in the high renaissance. But things are really perfected. It's a technically masterful uh, rendition of the human body and, the, and of the subject matter. And that's what we would expect in the high renaissance is that perfection and that elimination of the earlier elements from the gothic period that still you know existed in the early renaissance style here we have a pyramidal composition here it's mathematic it's stable it's harmonious it is uh, balanced and is very logical and oh, those are all things that appeal to these artists that are trying to make them seen make themselves seen as intellectuals rather right that use of math that use of calculation Okay, so of course, Michelangelo is heavily influenced by classical antiquity in terms of style. He actually starts his career by um, making fakes of classical antiquities. So he's really well versed in just what it is that makes something look classical. And so that emphasis on the classical is something that's really a large part of his works. It's a large part of the high renaissance. Here's that image of uh, Christ looking down at his face, really just a handsome, idealized representation of Christ and an elegant representation of Christ, right? Um, all of those things that we'd expect to see in the high Renaissance being shown here. Okay, this is Michelangelo's David. This was done out of a 14 foot piece of marble that had been rejected by a couple of different artists because it had a flaw in it. And they just said, you know, you, there's nothing you can do with this marble. But Michelangelo, of course, was able to do something with it and not to just do anything, but to do something really remarkable because he is a Renaissance man, right? He does all of these things. And not only does he do them well, but he makes it look easy. So that whole notion of sprezzatura. Okay, this is a really wonderful example of the humanism and the Neoplatonism of the High Renaissance. It's all very perfected. It's incredibly idealized. It's incredibly believable. There is that emphasis on the nude human form as a thing of beauty, the emphasis uh, Neoplatonically on the nude human form as something full of mathematical truths and something that brings you closer to God. So, uh, you know, if we think about it, we really have a similar perspective about our bodies. Like we may choose to keep them covered up uh, for the most part, but we, we do feel like there's something that is beautiful about our bodies and even divine. Um, it's humanistic not only in its convincing rendition of the body and the anatomy and the proportion, but also in its convincing human pose and a convincing human emotion. We'll see a detail of David's face in a minute that shows that. Uh, and then, of course, it's also very, very Neoplatonic, as we've discussed. He is graceful, right? He's poised, he's confident, he's he's intensely focusing on this battle that's at hand between him and Goliath. Uh, but even in spite of that, he is still a graceful, elegant figure. And that whole sense of uh, high Renaissance grazia is a part of this.
Now we know that Michelangelo does a number of different sketches. He is a very well-known draftsman. He does drawings all the time to prepare for his artworks. He practices diseño. He does that as a way to work out the complexities of the story and how he can communicate that most successfully. Um, it's an intellectually rigorous exercise, all this diseño that prepares them for the final product of work. Okay, it's very classical looking. Remember, we have talked about how the, the classical and the Christian coming together in this period is a true hallmark of the high renaissance, that even the high ranking figures within the Catholic Church uh, were very well, very comfortable with this classicism, were very comfortable with these classical philosophies. Uh, and that is true here as well. Michelangelo's David was initially meant to go on the buttress of the Duomo in Florence, the cathedral in Florence. Uh, and so you can see, you know, the, the Catholic Church being very, very much uh, confident and and comfortable with these classical styles and these classical, uh, classical philosophies. Okay, even though it was meant to go on the Duomo, it is actually commissioned by the city um, in Florence. And they were wanting to commission something that would be kind of politically uplifting and would make people proud of their city. And remember when we talked about the early Renaissance, we talked about David as being kind of this poster child for Florence, that they were a smaller city state. They felt like they were kind of the underdog, but they were able to overcome a lot of things. And in the end, they were able to kind of come out on top. Um, the whole notion of David is still going to appeal to the Florentines for that purpose. And right now they're really feeling challenged by, by Rome uh, and they want to set themselves apart from Rome and they want to set themselves up as a powerful republic. This is also the time period when the Medici family have been kicked out of Florence uh, and the Republican government is, is really trying to succeed and really trying to spread the reputation of its competence. So all of these ideas were really built in to this representation of the David, of the political power of the Republican government of Florence. Uh, even though they might be the underdogs, they're going to be able to triumph in the end. Okay, and Florence um, here, you know, when this was originally placed in situ, right, it's the original location, um, David was facing towards Rome. So it was really kind of meant to challenge the power of Rome in defense of Florence. Um, Florence really just saw itself as the new Athens or the new Rome uh, and felt that they were the inheritors of the classical tradition. So this classicism was really appealing in Florence. Uh, we have to remember to this really large scale, the colossal scale of this, 14 feet tall, that is something that was, um, was a trait of classical and antique sculpture as well. So even just the size of this is looking back to classical antiquity. So in the High Renaissance, not only do we have a perfection of those classical philosophies and the way they impact art, but we have lots of classical motifs and lots of classical elements and lots of classical style. There's that connection with the classical past um, throughout the works from the High Renaissance. Here's an image of where it was originally meant to go. This is a copy now. Um, and in fact, the one, uh, when it was done, they decided not to put it up on the Duomo and they put it in the city square of Florence. Um, there is now in the square, like a little kind of portico porch area where they have a copy of this and another a few works, but the original had been heavily damaged by being out in the open like that. And so now it's in the Academia, which is a museum uh, in Florence. Uh, the one other thing I want to kind of talk to you about, and this isn't the best image to do so, but did you notice that the head and the hand seemed a little bit large? There's some symbolism uh, going into that. Um, these Renaissance artists really felt like what they were doing with their hands was connected to what was happening in their mind. And so we see a lot of works from the High Renaissance, especially in Italy, that emphasize this connection between the head and the hand. So that's one reason why scholars look at this and think perhaps that's why the head and the hand are a little bit out of proportion. They're just a little bit big. Maybe they're trying to emphasize that idea of artists are intellectual as they work with their hands. The other idea though, is that perhaps they were a little bit out of proportion taking into account this original vantage point, right? This original location where it was meant to stand. Uh, that would have created a very different viewing experience than seeing it from only a couple feet underneath it. Uh, versus here. So those are the two ideas about why the head and the hand are a little bit a little bit different. 
Okay, here's Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. We're going to be pretty brief here. Julius II is the one that commissions this. So uh, remember, the Catholic Church is a huge driver of the patronage of the High Renaissance, very invested in paying for works of art and architecture to decorate the churches, to kind of um, make everyone look at the, look at these works of art and architecture and just feel like the Catholic Church is powerful. The Catholic Church is uh, magnificent. The Catholic Church is all-encompassing, right? Things that they really wanted to associate with themselves in light of the fact that they're trying to kind of bounce back from the Great Schism and and due to the troubles that they're kind of facing and the, the challenges that they're kind of facing in the years leading up to the Protestant Reformation. Michelangelo does the majority of this on his own. Okay? It's 134 by 44 feet, over 300 figures, 175 pictures, and a very much overall unified type of composition. It's an incredible achievement. He does it mostly by himself in four years. Uh, he has scaffolding that's up there, and I always kind of imagine him lying down on the scaffolding, but he doesn't. He stands up, and he has a lot of physical problems for the rest of his life just due to all of the, the toil that this took on his body to, to do this work. Now, originally, um, there was a different plan in mind, but Julius II, through their kind of negotiations to get Michelangelo to come and do this ceiling, because he really doesn't want to, uh, Julius II does allow Michelangelo a little more freedom than I originally had planned. Michelangelo also has a theological advisor, so someone that's really well versed in church doctrine and church theory that advises him and says, oh, you could put this in and that would be this kind of symbolism, this meaning, and you could put this in. And we're not going to have time to look at all those different kinds of connotations and meanings, but overall, there's a couple of dominant themes. First would just be the power of the church, right? That the church is powerful. And that, of course, makes a lot of sense in terms of this commission and the time frame in which it's done. The other overall relationship, or sorry, the overall communication, rather, is how, you know, God has power and how we have a relationship with God and how when we sin, it disrupts that relationship and there's kind of uh, difficulties that emerge because of that. Okay, so lots of references to contemporary religious ideas and writings, a great example of the complex symbolism that sometimes crops up in the High Renaissance. He underwent extensive renovation in the 80s and the 90s. Um, this is originally what it looked like before it was cleaned. And people really kind of freaked out after it was cleaned because they had come to expect that most of these Renaissance works were very earthy uh, just because of all the layers of, of soot and grime and, and ash and incense that had built up on them over the year. But when they were cleaned, they found out that that was not really true. But that a lot of Renaissance art was clear and had a clarity of, of atmosphere, it had bright colors. Uh, rather than the kind of earthy tones that they'd come to expect from the dirty works. Okay, so we're going to look in detail at the creation of Adam, which is a portion of of the ceiling. Uh, Michelangelo starts and he does a series of the of the paintings, has the scaffolding taken down so he can see what it's looking like, and realizes that some of the earlier scenes have too small figures and too much going on, that from you know 70 feet away, when you finally see that ceiling up there, it's just losing, losing, losing it in translation. So he has a new approach for these other, these other subjects, uh, more monumental figures with less kinds of details to distract. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here in this creation of Adam scene. So we have Adam over here on the left. He's about to receive the spark of life from God here on the right. Uh, God is surrounded by angels, also has Eve right there in the crook of his arm and the Christ child right there with his fingertips uh, on his shoulder. Now let's talk about Eve. Sometimes this is thought to be a representation of Sophia or divine wisdom. And that makes sense in the context of what's happening here. Uh, Eve also makes sense, right? Because Adam and Eve, and pretty soon it's going to be her turn to go down and uh, be on earth. But she's also talked about as being Mary. Okay? Now, these are all appropriate. And in fact, they all make sense, even if you see them all as being accurate, because of course, God is the author of wisdom. God gives wisdom to man. Adam is being uh, created here. Eve is going to be created next. And then Mary. How does that one work? Well, often... Christ and Mary were called the new Adam and the new Eve, right? Adam and Eve came to earth. They had the fall of man. 
we needed a savior and Christ and Mary came and they made up for that, for that fall and they offered salvation. So Christ and Mary as the new Adam and the new Eve, this was a really dominant Catholic kind of idea that comes up in many, many works of art. So all of that kind of makes sense. Now we know this figure is Christ over here on the far right because of the way that uh, the image of God is placing his fingers on his shoulders. So he's got that left hand, he's got the index and the thumb finger. Uh, and these are the two fingers in Catholic practice that you use to take the mass, right? The Catholic sacrament. For the Catholics, remember that is a literal miracle that occurs, right? The mass is occurring. You lift up that host, you lift up that piece of um, wafer and it transforms into the, into the flesh of Christ. And when you take that, it's a very literal thing, right? You're literally taking a part of Christ into you. Now for Protestants, that's all symbolic, right? Not, not literal. But here where he's got those two fingers on the shoulder of that figure, that lets us know that this is Christ. And we have to just understand that he is going to have to be sacrificed in order to make up for the fall of Adam and Eve. So all these ideas kind of work together. In terms of style, <clears throat> it's very humanistic, right? Idealized human form, accurate in terms of pose and proportion, using a lot of mathematics to do so, um, using a lot of the golden mean. Uh, it is very Neoplatonic, it's idealized, it is mathematical, and that use of idealism and math brings us closer to God. It is the Christian brought together with the classical because this is a very Christian subject matter, and these figures of Adam and Eve, and I'll show you in a minute, are based on classical sculptures from antiquity, so the classical and the Christian coming together. Uh, it is an example of diseño. Michelangelo sketched and sketched and sketched and sketched to prepare his artworks. He did that intellectual exercise to make sure that he was ready to create a very harmonious and a very intellectual final composition. It's not necessarily um, overall a pyramidal composition, but we do have elements that are, are very closely linked to that. If you think about um, Adam and this kind of rocky outcropping that he's on, right? We're getting the majority of a pyramid over on that side, but space is very convincing. Even though there's not a lot of attention to the background, Michelangelo knew that wouldn't be necessary. Pretty much figured that's kind of a waste of time when we're looking all the way down from the floor. Um, space is still pretty accurate. Modeling in the chiaroscuro, the three-dimensionality of the figures is all perfected. Um, this isn't necessarily sfumato, uh, Michelangelo doesn't use that as much as some of the other contemporaries. You've got a more crisp finish on these works, but nonetheless, uh, it's still seeming very convincing. It is very graceful, right? We have that sense of grazia going on as well. And overall, it's just very perfected. So all of these things that we'd expect in the high Renaissance style are done incredibly well, right? The elimination of the old fashioned elements and the perfection of the new Renaissance classicism. And of course, Michelangelo does that all, makes it look like it's easy because of the whole notion of sprezzatura. Here are those classical sculptures uh, that the work is modeled upon. We've got the Belvedere Torso on the left and the Crouching Venus on the right. So again, remember Michelangelo really aware of classical precedents and works those into his works. The other thing that's high renaissance here is the in-depth kind of symbolism. So what we have is we have um, this kind of form behind God. And there's a couple of different ideas about what that can represent. First, some people think it's a womb. And second, some think it's a brain. I think you can see both of those as accurate and both of them as having meaning to what's happening in the scene. I think we also have to realize that Michelangelo with his in-depth knowledge of anatomy would have been aware that both of those might have been brought to mind, right? So I think that to see them as only one or the other really isn't the most convincing way to approach this work. So why a brain? Uh, Neoplatonism at this time was really kind of emphasizing the fact that intellectuality was divine, like the body that wisdom and our, our brains made us godlike and that they were gifts from God. So there's also this Neoplatonic kind of idea that the brain is where the soul resides. So all of these things really work in the context of the story of the creation of man, how we get our knowledge from God, how it's our brains that make us godlike in some ways, right? Very humanistic as well, those Neoplatonic kinds of theories. So that all makes sense. The womb also makes sense because you can see this green kind of scarf towards the bottom comes up and it crisscrosses over Eve's leg. And that's thought to be kind of like the umbilical cord of, of the womb. And of course, 
Eve is the mother of all living. So that makes sense as well in the context of the creation. So either of those ideas, I think, are accurate. I think, in fact, to see them both as um, intentional on the part of Michelangelo really makes a lot of sense. This is the expulsion and temptation. We're not going to take time to look at this. But we will take time to talk about Raphael. Okay, he's the last artist that we'll talk about today. He is the kind of uh, last figure of this major triad of high Renaissance artists. He is um, a Renaissance man as well, and he does many things and makes them look easy. Right, that whole notion of spread the Torah. But what he is most known for, and most popular for, are these images of Mary and the Christ Child. He had a big workshop, and he's just cranking those out. Um, it was a, a very popular kind of item to have amongst the elite in Italy. Now, Raphael is going to be accurate with anatomy, but he is less interested in that than Leonardo and Michelangelo. But he does do disegno. He does really create these calculated compositions, a sense of balance and harmony that's meant to convey how intellectual he is as an artist. That is a large part of his works as well. So all the math. Um, is something that's heavily emphasized in his work. And not only do we have math in the bodies, but math in the compositions, math in the sense of mathematical perspective here, the pyramidal composition, all of these things are very mathematic and very balanced. So um, all that use of math shows him to be an intellectual. All that use of math is also very Neoplatonic and helps to create a really beautiful and ideal scene. And that beautiful truthfulness brings us closer to God. It's very humanistic, and we have a differentiation of the human body in terms of baby human bodies versus adult human bodies. Human poses are accurate. Human emotion is accurate. Um, all of those things are humanistic. The nude human form, right, for these little uh, infants, we've got the Christ child, and we have John the Baptist that has the little reed cross. That is his symbol. Um, it's different from the cross of Christ, so don't get those confused. Um, that's very humanistic as well. All right, now, we just have to remember that math in the High Renaissance is prevalent, but it doesn't lessen that sense of life, and it's perfected. Okay, we also have perfected modeling, chiaroscuro, perfected sense of recession into space, perfected atmospheric perspective, uh, perfected idealization, right, and incredibly graceful figures. I think Raphael is the best example of Grazia. His figures are so lovely, so graceful, so elegant, so beautiful, their poses, um, their sense of, of manners here, it's all very restrained uh, and graceful. So Grazia is a huge part of his works. Okay, there is too some symbolism here, more symbolism than what we usually have in the earlier works. You can see the poppies the back to the left of Mary. Those poppies are symbols of uh, death. They're symbols of Christ and his passion. They're symbols of the resurrection. So all of that makes sense in the context of the, the story here. Uh, in the front by her foot, so we've got strawberries. Those are symbolic of heavenly nourishment. Uh, so kind of like the help that she gets from heaven to face her role as Christ's mother. Uh, on her right, over by John the Baptist, right, the infant John the Baptist, we have daisies. And um, those are the innocence of these two children uh, in, in their lives, right? So all of these kind of symbolic meanings make sense. You can see just how beautiful and graceful uh, she is here, Mary, really being shown in an ideal way. She's wearing red to allude to Christ and his sacrifice and that she knows that she will have to sacrifice her son. She's also wearing blue, right, which is a way to show her as the queen of heaven. Raphael was a practitioner of disegno, right, that intellectual sketching out of possibilities to create a perfected uh, final product. Here's another sketch that he does in preparation for, for these kinds of mother and child scenes. Okay, our last example. Stick with me. We're almost done. Uh, Julius II is the patron for this again. This is the School of Athens, and it is a great example of how comfortable the Catholic Church is with classicism because this is a celebration of classical thought and classical philosophers, and it's right in the Pope's personal library himself. Okay, so the classical and the Christian together. It's pretty large. It's about 16 and a half feet by 25 feet, has 58 figures, and they're all just shown in pursuit of knowledge and the seven, seven liberal arts. Uh, there's a couple of things here that not only show the style of the time, 
but also show a couple of contemporary ideas. This is obviously really influenced by classicism. These are classical philosophers. They're all classical figures. They're wearing classical dress. They're in a classical setting, right? All those classical elements as a part of the high Renaissance art. Humanism, right? Perfection of the human form in pose and proportion with correct uh, mathematical ratios of the golden mean. Uh, all of that is perfected. Neoplatonism, the use of math, whether it's in the bodies, whether it's in the mathematical perspective, whether it's in the mathematical composition of the pyramidal composition, that's all very Neoplatonic, and that's meant to bring us closer to God. Right? It's perfected in terms of modeling and chiaroscuro, the way that they create a sense of order and harmony in this large group of figures. Um, all of that is, is very much a perfection of early Renaissance style. And even though there's so much math, it doesn't limit the sense of lifelikeness. It's also grazia, right? There's some elegance and some grace to these figures. Um, we have more symbolism, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we have a fresco here, another common medium of the High Renaissance, along with oil and tempera. So lots of different ways that this shows High Renaissance style, right? The classical together with the Christian, uh, and again, all these different kinds of style facets. Now, this is propaganda for the church, right? It is meant to make the Catholic Church look intellectual. It's meant to make the Catholic Church look cosmopolitan. It's meant to make the Catholic Church look smart and educated and powerful, uh, and not only powerful in the religious sphere, but also in the political sphere, as well as the intellectual sphere. And we have to just remember that the church is really in need of propaganda after the Great Schism and in the years leading up to the Protestant Reformation. So what is the symbolism going on here? What's what's happening with these kinds of re references? Uh, there's a few different kinds of things. Of course, we said that it is the you know, different kinds of liberal arts being practiced uh, as they were emphasized in classical antiquity. But we also have uh, different ages of figures pursuing these studies. So man should pursue intellectuality through all stages of life is kind of the message. It's very Neoplatonic, right? Neoplatonists, as we talked about with the creation of Adam, they're saying God is the one that gave us our intellect. Our intellect and our bodies are things that make us God-like. These are things that we should strive to develop and, and things that we should strive to, to better. We also have symbolism with the figures that are being shown. So on the right here, you're seeing the two key figures of the work, which are um, representations of Plato and Aristotle. Plato, on our left, is uh, pointing to the heavens as a way to kind of illustrate his emphasis on the metaphysical realm, um, the abstract realm of ideals. On our right is Aristotle. He's holding his palm down toward the earth uh, to represent his emphasis on our physical surroundings as uh, ways for us to pursue, pursue truth and understand knowledge. So those two figures there, if you look, the figure on the left, the model for that figure of Plato is Leonardo, right? And if we look at the left image on this same screen, the figure of Euclid that's bending over and, and showing people geometry, the model for that figure is Bramante, who is a contemporary architect to Raphael. Um, here we again can see those stages of man as they are pursuing different types of knowledge. And here we can see two figures on the right. The far right is thought to be Perugino, the teacher of Raphael. And right next to him, the figure to the left making eye contact with us is thought to be Raphael himself. And he's standing in for the figure of Apelles, who was this uh, renowned artist from classical antiquity. So the whole idea here is that we're celebrating these incredible minds from the classical past and that we put ourselves as artists in with them, right, on the same level as them. They contributed to our intellectual knowledge. We as artists are contributing to the intellectual knowledge as well. So all of these are kinds of ideas that show just how far the status of artists had risen from the days of the early Renaissance. And that during the high Renaissance, right, these artists were Renaissance men and they did a lot of things and made it look easy, right, that whole notion of sprezzatura. Uh, and that, that impacted the way that they painted their works, right? That's part of understanding high Renaissance style is to understand how these artists perceive themselves 
and how society perceived them. And by the fact that Raphael puts himself and other artists here in the work, and in fact, Michelangelo was the one uh, in the middle of the stairs, uh, he's included as well, says how Raphael esteems his fellow artists and esteems himself, right? We are on the same level as these great thinkers from history. Okay, really briefly, Venice is doing something different in the High Renaissance, just as they were doing something a little bit different in the Early Renaissance. The only thing I really want you to remember about Venice, you're not heavily tested on Venice, I just want you to remember that they are combining influences from the northern parts of Europe and influences from the southern parts of Europe, right from Florence and from Rome, and they're combining them together and bringing them together. When we talk about the Baroque era, when we come back from our exam, that's really going to be the hallmark of the Baroque, is bringing the North and the South together, creating a style that is international. So just kind of remember that, uh, that they're bringing those together, uh, and artists, in fact, in Venice are actually you know, incorporating some new things, like a little more dynamism, and a little more movement, and a little more drama, different kind of color palette, and some things that are going to be characteristic of the Baroque.